Hello, my friends. Welcome, welcome to uh, Project Management Professional Basics Kickoff. The purpose of this webinar is to help those interested in the PMP exam know a little bit more. This will probably run for anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. If you have questions as we cover the content, definitely put them in the chat box. And let's get started. So this is a basic webinar for those keen on taking the PMP exam. My name is Phil. I'll be your host, your friend, your colleague taking you through this trajectory to certification. I got certified as a PMP back in 2005. That is going on 17 years now. And since I've gotten certified, I've helped so many individuals across the world, thousands and thousands of people ace this exam and do well on it. My buddy Roy trains the Agile component. You'll see him every now and again in some of our videos and in some of our courses talking about what exactly Agile is. We're both very passionate about Agile. There are two documents that I would request that you read. And these documents are out there on PMI's website. What I'm going to do right now is put a link to those two documents in the chat. So when we get off here, if you wanna go look up the PMP exam content outline, and if you wanna take a look at the handbook, please do that. And thank you, I see our friend Adewale join. Thank you for your chat. If you have any questions, my friend, put them in the chat there and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else who is joining, good to have you as well. All right, so the company behind this training, Prazion, is a project management and leadership training firm. We train worldwide. Many, many organizations and government agencies have used our training to get certified, to know more about project management, to get certified as a certified scrum master, as a project management professional, agile certified practitioner, and many more. So this is what we're gonna be talking about today. What is project management? Who is the PMI? What is the PMP exam? We'll even talk about the CAPM exam. And by the time we're done, you'll know if this is for you or not. So let's go straight into project management. I want you to think for yourself about project management. What exactly is it? You've heard the term projects, project management, but what exactly does it mean? It means different things to different people. So if you could do me a favor, just chat in, what exactly you think project management is, that will get our dialogue started. But let's talk about a very interesting survey. This survey on the screen, 90% of global senior executives ranked project management methods as either critical or somewhat important to their ability to deliver successful projects and remain competitive. Think about that, 90% of global senior executives. That means project management is important. It's no longer up for debate, it's a fact. Now, of the organizations that use project management in a deliberate fashion versus those that don't, as you'll see from this next survey, those that don't are missing out because those firms that use a method 38% meet budget, whereas those that don't use the methodology, 31% meet budget. What about those that use a method and the expected benefits? 60% meet expected benefits and 51% meet expected benefits in those firms that don't use a method. So what am I saying? You can find an almost 10%. 9, 10% differential, that's huge. Especially when we're talking about millions of dollars. So the point of this survey from PwC is that it pays to be deliberate in your project management. It pays to be intentional. 
So what exactly is project management and what is a project? Let's take a look at some examples. So back in 2500 BC, we had this, the pyramids of Giza, way back. This is a project. Why do we say it's a project? Because it had a start and an end date. They started and they ended. That's what a project is. What about the Great Wall of China? 800 BC to 206 BC, another great example of a project. So you don't need to look too far to see examples of projects. Project management is really managing projects. It's applying knowledge and skills and tools and abilities and techniques to manage the projects. Basic elements of project management are managing resources, maintaining a schedule, coordinating different groups. If you read the good book, you see examples of Noah's Ark, what a project that must have been. And all throughout history, you see many other examples. But there's one key thing PMI will test on your exam, and it's not about the tools. It's really more about the mindset. This quote says, great project management is not great because of software tools. It is made great because of the great minds and the great attitudes behind the tools. So you've got some project managers who are awesome in what they do, but they're not good with people. And as a result, they end up not being very good project managers. They're good with the tools, but they're not good with the people. That's not what the PMI is going to test you on. PMI is going to make sure that you have got the right mindset. See? So project management, like I said, has been around for a long time. And um, some of you might be thinking of taking the exam to make it official that you are actually a project manager, right? I like the quote, uh, the chat here from our friend that Diwali says, project management is coordination, organizing, monitoring, controlling an endeavor to achieve a specific objective with a timeline attached to it. Very good. I see our friend Nafid Nasser also chatted in. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you're here. You got any questions, comments, contributions, feel free to put them in that chat box. So moving on to how project management has evolved, late 19th century, let's talk about what happened. So people, business leaders, they were tasked with getting stuff done better, more efficiently. And that introduces people like Henry L. Gantt, who was the originator, the inventor of the Gantt chart. Gantt chart is named after him a brilliant way of tracking your timelines. Now everyone uses it. Microsoft Projects, Smartsheets, Monday.com. You've probably gotten all those adverts on YouTube. They all use the Gantt chart. What about the milestone chart? Which is like from the Gantt chart anyway, right? These are things that are used today. They have evolved over time. And talk about the evolution. Let's talk about the PMI because this is where the Project Management Institute comes in Five awesome individuals, as you see, the very first, if you will, of PMI officials, members, they form the PMI. These are the founders of the PMI. Some of them aren't with us anymore, but their work far outlives them because PMI put project management on the map, on the map. Back in 1969, when very few people even knew what project management was, these folks got together and said, you know what, well, let's form an organization. And PMI is a leading global association for project management today. Now the growth of PMI and the PMP exam, it can be seen in this next graphic that I put together back in 2015 thereabouts. When I put this together, it showed the timeline from the very beginnings of the PMP exam. Take a look at when the PMP exam just started, this whole concept back in 1984. There were 40 people certified, 1986, 102. It just started growing in leaps and bounds. Getting to 2015, when I put this together, you can see how many PMPs there were. 655,576, and you thought that was a lot, right? That was back in... 2015, you thought that was a lot. But if I was going to draw this today, it will look like this. It will go through the roof because now we have over 1.2 million. Think about that. 
Do you know what 1.2 million looks like? So when I hear people saying, I want to get certified, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Are you kidding? If 100, if 1.2 million people could do it, you can do it. We're not talking about hundreds here, millions. That shows you there's a place for you. If you truly mean business and getting certified, you absolutely can do it. You can. So a lot of what the PMP exam is about is documented in a number of publications. It wouldn't be fair for me not to show you these publications. I wanna show you these one by one. The very first publication is the oldest in all that I'm gonna show you. It's called the Pembuck Guide Sixth Edition. This may actually soon be out of print. You're gonna find it hard to, to get a new one. This is my beaten up one. It's followed me on the road all over Europe and Canada and America, so it's beat up. It will be hard for you to find one like this. This next book came out around the same time as the Pembuck Guide Sixth Edition. This one is called the Agile Practice Guide. The next one came out last year. It's not even a year old yet. It's called the Pembuck Guide Seventh Edition. So there are three publications that are very often referred to for this exam. Just be aware of that. So when you come aboard the journey to getting certified, you need to be able to digest huge amounts of information. Now, let me give you my honest truth and honest opinion, because I know people are going to ask me the question. Do I need to read all of them? And the answer is no. But would it make sense to read it, speed read it? Absolutely. In fact, today, I'm going to take you through a very quick tour of this book and a little bit of the other one, right? So this, you can speed read it. If I were you, I'd put aside four hours, go to your local library or go under a tree and, you know, the region where it's not going to be too hot, stay under the tree, read it, speed read it. If you need to know more about speed reading, you can Google everything, right? But I want to recommend Jim Quick, K-W-I-K. Google him and learn his tricks to speed read and it will help you. As you come on this journey for PMP, you ain't got time to be reading this thing for 13, 14 hours. No, that's not the way to do it. Don't do it. Speed read it. You can. Now, if you're on time crunch, go to page 555 and begin reading that forward till you get to the end of at least the high level. It shouldn't take you more than a couple of hours. <clears throat> this one, I however recommend reading it, right? It's size, it's not too big. It's not um, humongously sized. So you should be able to read that. This one over here, I would recommend not reading it. I would recommend if you are going to, you could look for my videos on Pembok Guide 7th edition, just Google Pembok 7th training, Pembok 7th course, Prazion, put the name of the company, it'll come up with a bunch of videos. I wouldn't recommend taking time out to read it. However, personally, I feel it's my professional responsibility to know all that this exam is about. So if I were you, if you can, speed read it. I have two videos on here on YouTube. One is two hours. The other one is about an hour and a half or so watch the video, you'll be done. You don't have to read it. Now, gone are the days when people would actually have to read every single word in this book because the way the exam was set before was almost more like rote memorization. Um, it was very difficult back then. Now they are approaching it from a more humanistic and uh, psychological point of view. So there's no need for you to do all of that. Now, if you are on my program, I have a number of vehicles there's one that I put in the description. This is called Project Management Layman's Guide. I like simple. I hate making things difficult. You can find this on Amazon. It's just 132 pages. This for anyone who feels they are a layman and don't know about formal project management, this is gonna help them. It's a very, very flimsy book, but it's got tons of substance and it's got a 50 question mock exam at the end, which will really help you. For when I train this course with others, I also use this book called PMP Exam Immersion. This is a book that's dedicated to people who really be in business. I want to get into it, but that comes later on. Okay. So the reason I'm showing you all these books is to let you know the exam has a lot of content. And if you really want to do great on the exam, you never really studied project management before, but you have been a project manager. 
my recommendation is go with an animal handler who knows the animal. <laughs> go, go with someone who really knows what they're talking about, you know, such as the course that my buddy Roy and I have. Now we can go to the next slide. Now, if there are questions, which they usually are, uh, please ask any questions if you have some. All right, so moving on. What is the PMBOK guide? The PMBOK guide is accepted good project management practices. It's used to manage most projects, documents, emerging good practices, and it's a common lexicon for project management. Now let's answer the question, what is project management? A project is a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. Projects start and end on like operational work, which continues throughout the life of the organization. So we can say project management is the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities to produce a specific deliverable. That's what project management is. All right. Now, going back to the genesis of this exam, let's jump into some more exam-specific stuff. One of the questions I get is, how do I know that I'm eligible to take this exam? Let's take a look. So the exam has a number of eligibility criteria. There are really three buckets when you boil it down. First bucket is, I have a high school diploma. I don't have a degree. If you have a high school diploma, then you need five years of project management experience and 35 contact hours of formal project management education. We have a course where you can get that 35 hours of education. You'll find some information at the end of it all. I'll put that in the link below. All right, we also have another category, which is a bachelor's degree or global equivalent. In this category, you need three years, 36 months of unique non-overlapping professional project management experience. So 35 contact hours of formal education as well. The third category here is bachelor's or postgraduate degree from a GAC accredited program. If that is you and you went to a college that is GAC accredited with PMI, then you only need two years, which is 24 months of unique non-overlapping professional project management experience. And that's pretty much the breakdown as far as what you need to show proof that you are eligible to take the exam. What exactly is the PMP exam? It's 180 multiple choice questions. It's 230 minutes. Only 175 questions count. There are five that are pre-test questions. The passing score is undisclosed. Questions are very situational. And the PMI will evaluate your proficiency in each domain. If you want to understand a little bit more about how this works, just Google Angoff cutoff technique. It'll give you some ideas about how this works. It's not based on a one passing score, one size you know, fits all type of passing score. And that's why PMI has not disclosed for the past almost 13 or 14 years, a particular passing score. There used to be one, but I'm not even gonna tell you what it is because it's inconsequential at this point. The bottom line is you need to do well, you need to do great. So it's a highly situational exam that will test how well you can respond to several real world agile, hybrid and predictive scenarios. Three hours, 50 minutes, five questions don't count. Though tough, majority of our students pass the PMP on their first try. In fact, all the students that came through a masterclass because here you can see we have PM Masterclass. In fact, if you go to projectmanagementmasterclass.com, you'll be able to sign up for the course that we're talking about here. But all of our students from the Project Management Masterclass have all passed the exam in the past year. It's highly situational. Formulas and calculations may not be as prominent. Questions could be drag and drop, MCQ, and things like that. You can get more about this in the chat that I put in there. I said, sent you the PMI's outline and handout. I'd advise that you take a look at that. All right, let's talk about the content. So the content on the exam is broken out into people, one section, process, one section, and business, another section. People is all about human interactions. Process is all about the tools and techniques that you use for project management. 
and business is all about business strategy relating to agile, predictive, and hybrid. The five steps to getting certified. One, make sure you're eligible. Two, decide, am I going to do this or not? You got to make up your mind. I'm doing it and I'm not backing out. Decide to pursue the certification. There are pre-study activities that you should do, like sign up to be a member of the PMI and start your application. There's actually a video on this channel about the application. I'll endeavor to put that in here now before I forget. So I'm going to send you in the chat a video that explains how to complete the PMP application form. It's a bit of a longer video. So when you get a moment, you can go watch that. All right. Number four, the masterclass, projectmanagementmasterclass.com. You can sign up for training there. There are many other options for training. But like I said, get an experienced animal handler. It's a beast, this exam. And step five, pass the exam. Those are pretty much the five steps to success. Whenever you're taking the test, decide to go with backup, with help. All right, so here's a breakdown of the exam in a pie chart. You can see process is bigger than the other areas. People is quite big itself as well. And just remember that the exam is split into two, agile and hybrid and predictive as well. So you've got many different ways of looking at the exam. You could divide it by process group if you wanted to, even though the PMI don't do that anymore, but you could say, what part of my exam is gonna be a lot of planning? What part of my exam is gonna be a lot of the knowledge is? Well, part of my plan is gonna be agile, hybrid, predictive. You know, you could slice it. And what I advise people to do is look at it from different angles so that you cover your basis. So these breakdowns of the exam, that I showed you in the previous slide, we call those domains, as you can see, people, process, and business. And these domains, they have tasks, and each task has enablers. Tasks, pretty much the underlying responsibilities of the project manager, what you are expected to do, and enablers are examples of the work associated with the task. So there's a lot to study. Their books, like I showed you, Agile Practice Guide, PMBOK Guide 6, Project Management Essentials is our book. There's also the Scrum Guide, which is another book. We recommend a lot of stuff to our students, but we do it gradually. We're not asking you to read everything in the first week. Spread it out, but just know where everything is, okay? So this is how the exam is broken out pretty much domain, and each domain has a set of tasks. You will be tested on the tasks. And the specific enablers is just one way you could look at the task. Again, look for the link that I shared with you earlier. That link will help you understand uh, what exactly the exam is made of. You'll be able to download this document right here. All right, so the link on the screen I have put in the YouTube chat if you're watching on YouTube. All right, let's take a look at some examples of the exam question. So PMI gave these as examples. These are drag and drop. So this matches this. You got to drag and drop on the exam. Click on the monitor engagement, drag it to where it belongs type thing. So that's just one type of question. You don't get a whole lot like this. We've heard people say maybe they got one, maybe a couple, really depends. All right, here's another one where you need to click on a hotspot. This is called a hotspot type of question. Here's another type of question that could be graphical. This is one that I wrote. You could get short questions on Agile or long questions on Agile. You could get short questions on predictive, long questions on predictive, okay? When you're filling in your application form, uh, pay attention to this format. It's also in the link that I put in the chat that will help guide you on what to expect. Now, here's the cycle of life for the exam. When you are done with training and you have all the prerequisites, you have the training from us uh, or whichever source you have used, maybe even training from a previous life, previous world in project management, it does not expire, right? When you're done, put in your application, send it in. PMI will review it for five days. You could be audited, which means PMI could ask for proof that what you've put in your application is true. Only about 10, sometimes 20% uh, of individuals have been audited based on what I have experienced as a trainer. Not a whole lot of my students, but around 10 to 20%. Uh, 
uh, the application payment process. Once you submit the credential fee payment, you can schedule your exam. So you pass the audit, you pay the PMI. Again, if you're not audited, then you just jump that step and go straight here. You pay the PMI and then you schedule multiple choice examination eligibility. You got one year to take it. One year and three strikes, you're out kind of thing. You got three tries. Now for every try, you got to pay the PMI more money, which is why you want to get this done one time. Certification cycle starts the day you get certified and you've got three years to get 60 professional development units. You can complete the renewal process once you've earned and reported the 60 PDUs. This occurs on the third anniversary of the day you pass the exam. Credential expiration happens if you've not expired at the end of three years. This has happened to me before, not a good place to be. If you've got a ton of certifications, keep your eye on them because if they expire and go a year without renewal, that's it. You have to take the exam all over again. Not good. You don't want that to happen. All right, so that is it. That's pretty much the cycle of life for the PMP. To make it a little bit clearer, if you were on one of our programs, we would send you study materials. We would have a kickoff like this. You would then begin studying with us, either live on the learning system, and we'll check in with you weekly, check in with us. Uh, there'd be a mock exam that you would need to take. We'll mail you your certificate, email you your certificate. You'd complete the exam application. Just follow the steps I showed previously. Send it to the PMI. You could be audited or not. If you're audited, go through the audit, schedule the exam at a Pearson test center. There's so many Pearsons all around the world, but schedule it, I would recommend, at a Pearson test center. You could actually take the exam at home, but look, read my lips. This is very risky. I know some people say, I took it at home without incident. It wasn't that big a deal. I'm technology savvy. There are a lot of people who are technology savvy and have had big, big problems because it's not about your savviness or the lack thereof. It's about the system. It's about the system. The sometimes system's just crazy. I've had two students who have had to each take the exam three times before things were sensible. Took the exam, crashed. Took the exam, person didn't show up. The proctor didn't show up. You don't want that to happen to you. So my recommendation, really consider going to a test center. All right? And step 12, pass the exam. All right? Now, before we go, we got to break project management down a little bit more just so that you got a good idea of what it is. So core concept in project management, projects need to be authorized. They need to be initiated, started off. And then we need to plan the projects. And after we got a plan, we do the plan, we execute the plan. And then we monitor and control the plan to make sure that it is really going good. And then we close the project or a part of the project. We call this the process groups. This is something that you should know as you dive into this world, because that's how we're breaking down our experience. Initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, and controlling, and closing. Another breakdown of project management is by knowledge area. These are areas of knowledge. Integration, weaving everything together. Scope, scoping out the project. Schedule, scheduling the project. Cost, costing out the project and managing the cost. Quality, managing the quality resource management, managing the resources, human equipment, material supplies, communications, risk management, procurement management, and stakeholder management. Now to give you a little bit more meat on the bone as far as what these are, you can see on the screen, I'll let you read them for a second. So just read through them. And if you've got any queries about any of them, just let me know. All right, any questions, comments, and concerns, always let me know. So that's a breakdown of how the knowledge areas work pretty much. If you take the process groups and the knowledge areas and put them together, you get this scary thing, which by the way, you don't have to cram or memorize. You just need to understand what it's talking about at a high level. We cover that during the training, but this is the notorious page 25. Again, you don't need to cram it. You just need to understand the concept. Every knowledge area has processes and what you're seeing here are the processes. Again, this is not cram material. I'm not saying you need to cram it, but here we have various processes. 
every knowledge area going that way, going horizontally, right? Every knowledge area has a set of processes that help the team to effectively manage the project, help the project manager and the team, right? So you'd go in that direction. If you wanted to learn more about each one, maybe spend two, three minutes on each one, I want to recommend to you that you look for my series on YouTube. It's called the One Minute Summaries. I'm going to send that to you right here in the chat. So I'll send you one of the links and you can kind of trace the others on our channel. It's called the one minute, call it the one minute summary. So I'll send you the one for integration. And from there you can trace the others. All right, here we go. All right, so you can trace the others by looking that way. All right, again, I highly discourage cramming. I'm not saying cram, don't cram, just understand what exactly this is saying, okay? I am going to show you in the next few minutes, every single one of these explained at a macro level, very, very high level. This will go very quick. I promise I will not make it laborious and painful. I will make it as quick as I can, because I know this is an area people dread, but we should talk about it now that we're here. What I'm gonna do is give you one word for each process, okay? This is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna go through the content going downwards like this, okay? And those of you who are project managers, truly, this is not a big deal. This is what you do every day. You just do it in different ways, right? So we're gonna take a look at initiating to closing. We're gonna do it very quick just to give you the context. Here we go. Are you ready? Okay. <clears throat> so initiating is the genesis of the project. One of the first things we do in project management is we create a project charter. The project charter authorizes the project manager to apply resources to the project, pretty much puts the project on the map. The next thing we do is we identify our stakeholders, people that could be affected by the project, people, the project, uh, people that the project could benefit from, based on their influence. Anyone who thinks they are a stakeholder, they're also a stakeholder for that time. So people who could be affected, people who could affect the project and people who think they're gonna be affected. The next process group you see is planning. And in creating a project management plan, which is the first thing we do, we're just gonna to put together all of the tiny little plans. Let me give you a visual. We're gonna put every plan that we get from all the knowledge areas, we're gonna put all these plans together and we're gonna get a final project management plan. Now, remember we could plan progressively. It doesn't always have to be everything planned up front. We plan in stages and iteration, so keep that in mind. Now going into the details in planning, we first of all plan how to manage scope and how to collect our requirements, we call that plan and scope management. And then we actually get into collecting the requirements. And then we get into defining the scope of the project in a project scope statement. In other words, what is included in this project, what is not. The next thing we do is we create a work breakdown structure. Now this is a horizontal WBS, but it just shows how the work is decomposed. Here's another example of a more mundane WBS for baking a cake. The Department of Energy gave us a brilliant example of a WBS for building a house. So you start off at level one, break it down into smaller chunks, concrete, framing, plumbing, and so on. And then you break that down even further into what we call work packages. But you can have a WBS that's seven levels. This is just a three level WBS. They could go all the way down to a level seven on some projects, such as ones I've seen, I've worked on. All right, let's very rapidly cover what happens in schedule management. First of all, you plan how to develop your schedule, how to manage it, and then you begin to do it. You define the activities, which is like a list of things to do. You sequence them, you put them in order, 
And then you estimate the durations based on the order, the resources involved. And by the time you do that, you got your schedule. If you've worked in smart sheets or project, you've seen one of these, we call that a project schedule. The next thing we do in this going down the list, not really in the real world, because in the real world, there's a lot of overlap, right? I know a lot of folks think it's sequential. It's not. In the real world, there's a lot of overlap. So the next thing that we're going to talk about in order is planning how to manage cost and then estimating each line item. How much will each task cost? And then you roll that up into a total amount. You're considering all of the resources here, right? And that's determined budget. The next area we talk about in this sequence is quality management. The project manager and the team should plan how to manage quality. They should have a quality management plan, and that keeps them on the straight and narrow as far as upholding the standards. Then we talk about planning resource management. This is really all about acquiring your resources. How are you going to do that? Whenever you see this word in your PMP journey, this word right here, plan, this is one of those, how will we, how am I going to do that? How am I going to manage my resources? How am I going to acquire my resources and things like that? So whenever you see that, you know that we're going to come out with a plan. In this case, it's a resource management plan. This kind of guides you how you're going to do that. The next thing you do is you estimate activity resources and you come out with resource requirements. Now, in the real world, ain't nobody got time for all this stuff, plan, plan, plan on paper. No, you implicitly know it on many projects, but there's some where you actually go this far. Some projects you go pretty detailed, like creating a responsibility assignment matrix. You juxtapose a WBS and an OBS, you get a RAM. You could use this RAM to understand who is assigned to what, how many hours are they assigned to. So we can go pretty hard in the real world. I've been on a lot of huge, huge multi-million projects where this is the order of the day. So even though there's small companies that don't do it, there are a lot of big companies that do. And that's why some of this stuff is on the exam. The next thing we talk about is planning communications management. We create a plan. It's called a communications management plan. It's pretty much how are we going to communicate? What are we going to communicate? Why and when? What are the five W's when it comes to this? The what, when, why, who, how, where, all that stuff you talk about it. Now let's go into an area which is really mammoth on the exam. It's the area of risk. But what is a risk? It's uncertainty that could impact the project. You take a look at this image, you could see negative uncertainty for the mouse. The trap could kill it, right? But you can also see negative uncertainty for the homeowner if the mouse gets the cheese. Hopefully, <laughs> The mouse will be eventually caught, but risk is all about uncertainty. Taking a look at risk, the very first thing we do is we plan how to manage risk. So we create a risk management plan to guide us. And then we identify the risks. We identify what could affect us, what could hold us back, what could, what could set us back, what could throw us off course. And after you've identified the risk in this cause risk effect, effect format, you begin to document more stuff by qualitatively analyzing the risks and then quantitatively analyzing it from a more monetary perspective. And you're ultimately gonna plan how to respond to the risks. The next thing we talk about here is procurement management. And here, this is where we plan, do we need to buy something from outside the firm? You make a make or buy decision. And if the decision is to procure from outside the firm, then you put together a procurement management plan and off you go. There's one more. The last area is procurement. Uh, I beg your pardon, the last area is stakeholder after procurement. This is chapter 13. And if you're going down the list in the planning order, what we have here is plan stakeholder engagement. We create a plan for how to engage our stakeholders that we have already identified. Remember, we've already identified the stakeholders. Well, this is where we are going to plan how to engage the stakeholders we identified. And that's planning in a nutshell. You got all of these tiny little pieces that I covered really rapidly, put them together and boom, there you have it. You have your project management plan and that's what the project manager uses to drive work. That is what the project manager should use with the team to ensure that the tasks are done. All right, let's talk about executing. This is gonna go really quick. 
First thing we do is we direct and manage the project work. In other words, we execute the plan. The next thing we talk about is managing project knowledge. We use existing knowledge gleaned, we create new knowledge, and we ensure knowledge is shared. We create a lesson learned, lessons learned. You might hear post-mortem analysis, pretty much all the same thing. Next thing we do here, we have manage quality. This is where we carry out audits to ensure that work is car being carried out as planned. Uh, we see quality audits, but there's a difference between QA and QC. QA is checking the work. QC is checking the product. So when, when I want to distinguish between these two, QA is all about process. QC is all about product. Just remember it like that. You won't get lost. All right. Next, we talk about acquiring the resources, human equipment, material supplies, facilities, whatever else you need. And then we talk about developing the team, the humans. We get them pumped, energized, motivated, inspired. And then we, of course, lead the team. It's called manage team, which I'm not a huge fan of the name, but it's, it really boils down to leadership, guiding the team to success while giving them feedback. The next thing we talk about is managing communications, which is actually communicating. Next thing we talk about is implementing the risk responses that we decided we would. We carry out the responses. And the next one is we conduct procurements. We select a seller or seller and we award a contract. Final one in executing is managing stakeholder engagement. And that is making sure your stakeholders are, this is actually engaging the stakeholders, I beg your pardon. This is where you actually get up from behind the desk and go to where the stakeholders are and engage with them, talk with them, find out more about them and interact with them to increase your chances of success. That's really what you do here. All right, moving into monitoring and controlling as a process group. Again, it's going to go very quick, but these are some of the areas that we look at. We look at something called the triple constraint. Constraints are limitations that restrict the project. So we're going to take a look at schedule constraints, cost constraints. Traditionally, we call this the IM triangle. One side of the triangle cannot change without the other. So what we're doing in monitoring and controlling is really taking a look at the entire process group and the things that happen in it. And at a high level in monitor and control project work, we're creating work performance reports to tell the story of our journey. How well are we doing at a high level? We integrate all the areas, we get all of this work performance information, we put it into a work performance report, and that report could be shared with stakeholders. The next thing we talk about here is managing changes. We call it performing integrated change control. This is where you review, approve, or reject project change requests. The next one we have here is validate scope. This is where your customer is either approving or accepting the deliverable. Next, we talk about control scope. This is where you, the project manager, prevents people from doing what was not planned, adding extras that are not part of the project or that are not accounted for. That's scope creep, we don't like that. The next thing we talk about is controlling the schedule, preventing delays. Then we control cost, making sure that cost overruns are prevented as much as possible. If there's a change, then we need to investigate it and make sure we're on track. In this area, we have formulas for earned value. So if you were to come on this program with us, at some point in the course, you will definitely be hearing about the schedule performance index, the cost performance index, the schedule variance and the cost variance. For those of you already on the journey, you do remember they all start with earned value, right? You're gonna learn more about earned value when you come aboard the program. As far as indices, we divide when we use the term index and when we have the word variance, we subtract. And that is pretty much how earned value works for your exam. This is just a tip of the iceberg. I'm only trying to whet your appetite because there's a lot more to talk about where this is concerned, all right? But this is some of it, all right. The thing about earned value, the, the schedule performance index tells you how healthy you're doing in terms of schedule, Cost performance index, how well you're doing in terms of cost. Schedule variance, how well you're doing in terms of the schedule, but it shows you a variance in dollars. And the cost variance, it shows you a cost variance in dollars. So it's really more about the health of the project. 
if you come on this journey with us, you are going to be facing that. That was just a teaser. All right, control quality is all about ensuring that the final deliverable is good to go to the customer before sending it. Like I said in the beginning, quality assurance is all about prevention, all about process, making sure your processes are good, keeping errors out of the process. Control quality, which is quality control, that's detection, keeping errors out of the customer's reach. Both are important. Next one we have here is controlling resources, but this is not about human resources. This is about the physical resources, making sure they showed up to the work site, making sure they were used as planned. Monitor communications. It's all about checking your communications and making sure that it is working. Are we communicating great on the project? If not, what are we gonna do differently? Monitor risks is all about monitoring your risk performance, making sure that you are managing risks effectively and if not, doing something about it. Control procurement is making sure the seller or the vendor is providing what they said according to the contract. Monitor stakeholder engagement is checking to ensure that stakeholders are engaged effectively. Let's talk about the final process group. It's closing. This is closing out a phase, closing out a contract or the entire project. In closing out a phase of a project, you're involved in ensuring stakeholder satisfaction, transitioning the deliverable, doing the lesson learned, paying the sellers, releasing resources and archiving documents. If you've got any questions about anything that I've talked about here, you can either put them in the comments below or you can send an email to us. It's support at praiseion.com, or you can just go on down to the website. All right, so that is the 40,000 foot view of the traditional site. Hey, tra traditional site. Th this is just the kickoff. Do you see how intense this is? I got a lot of people tapping out saying, Phil, I, my head, I can't, I gotta go. Uh, this is the beginning. This is a beginning. So consider this as your first class. This is your first class, first class, right? All right. Hopefully you continue the dialogue with us. And like I said, just go on down to projectmanagementmasterclass.com. If you're finding value from this and you want to continue that dialogue, you want to continue the motion because you've invested time in staying with me this long, you got you to go to the end, my friends. You got to see it through to the end. But, but this is just part one. Let's talk about part two. We're gonna talk about Agile now, okay? We're gonna make a case for Agile. So I've talked about traditional project management, but did you know there's another mousetrap? In many instances, it could be a better one. Not all the time, but a lot of times it could be a better mousetrap. Right here on the screen, I'm showing you another matrix. It's called a Stacy model. On the y-axis, we could have the requirements themselves and on the x-axis, we can have technicality. Think about it like this. You're working on a project. The requirements are either very well known or not very well known. You either know technically what you're going to do, how you're going to pull it off, or you don't. And what you're seeing here, we call it the Stacy model. Ralph Douglas Stacy put this together. Rest his soul. Brilliant way of illustrating when you need to be either predictive or traditional versus agile. So right over here, we've got requirements that are close to agreement. Very clear. We've got a very clear idea of what we're going to do, what the requirements are. And then as far as the technicality behind it, we're close to certainty. So we know what to do and we're capable. We understand technically what to do. You can use a simple approach. In other words, you can plan everything out that simple. Planning everything out, it's simple. But when you don't have a very clear idea of the requirements and things are hazy, you are beginning to go into far from agreement. And the technical certainty, you're beginning to go far from certainty. So the moment things begin to get a little bit more complicated, this is where you need to be on your marks, right? Because you, you can see the train come in. It, it's not looking very easy anymore. This is where you need to begin putting on your agile thinking cap. Begin, begin putting it on. I'm not saying it's firmly on your head yet, but you're beginning to say, hmm, this is complicated. It's not simple. Now, let me give you an example of complicated. Have you ever taken 
a watch or a clock apart? Have you seen how many things are in that thing? My mom's watches back in the day, they were my victims. I would take them apart when I was little and I would be amazed at how many things were in. But then my job was to put the watch back together exactly as it was. I took delight in doing that. Now, assembling a watch is complicated. It's got many parts, but it can be done if you follow step by step. So you could still use rather predictive approaches, even for complicated work. The problem is when you begin to hit more complex, fairly far from agreement and fairly far from certainty, and you're hit with a complex zone, this is where agile works best, where there's high variability, need to experiment, need to discover, and where change is highly likely. If I asked you, can you drive from wherever you are to one of my favorite places out in British Columbia known as Kamloops? Can you do that? Some of you be like, Cam what? Where is that? Now that's an example of drive into a place you've never driven before. That could be complex. This is where you need to be more agile in your thinking. Now, let me show you what the difference is between predictive and agile at a snapshot, right? So this is you, you're going from point A to point B. You've been there before, been there, done that. Easy, it's a straight line pretty much. You've been there before, you know how to get there, right? Point A that you've been to so many times, and point B. Now, if you were going from a point A to a point C that you've never been to ever, this is where you need to be thinking about Agile because going there is not going to be a straight line. You're going to be so off course at first, and you're probably going to do things in tiny little increments you might find yourself almost back at square one in some instances, like almost back. And then you're like, oh, oh, I think we lost our way. Okay, let's go, let's go. Okay, we're getting it. We're getting, oh, we're off course. Uh, and eventually you get there. This is what Agile is all about. It's a series of experiments. This is your predictive world. Sometimes it makes sense to do predictive, but if you've never been to this place before, this is where you need to be thinking agile. That's the general idea. So in the Stacy model, when we take a look at it, you got to understand and appreciate there's a time to be predictive and there's a time to be agile. Huge loss of life, loss of stakes, potentially, you want to be more predictive. And that's pretty much how it works. There are times when you need to be more predictive. But if there's a lot of uncertainty and it's stuff you've never been or done, then you need to be thinking more agile. And there are going to be periods where you could combine both methods. We call that a hybrid approach. A hybrid approach will combine agile and predictive in different measures. You could do them one after the other. Agile and then predictive. You could do agile and predictive together. I call it an agile predictive sub. We could do a whole lot of agile, a little bit of predictive, a whole lot of predictive, a little bit of agile. Now, what do I mean by a little bit of agile? Because what exactly is agile? Well, first and foremost, agile is a mindset. Okay. It's a mindset that you have. And then there are practices that come along with the mindset, which we talk about all throughout the course. Too many things to talk about here. I would say just Google Praise Your Agile Manifesto. You'll see a number of videos I've got about the Agile Manifesto, which is something you need to know on top of this. But to make a case for Agile one more time, in the world of predictive, we're pretty much fixed with our scope. But in the world of Agile, we flip that triangle that I talked about, the iron triangle on its head. And what we're doing here is being flexible with our scope. And there are times when that makes more sense than anything else. Okay? That's the mindset. So for those of you who are still on the fence, just remember we got over a million, over a million people who have been on this journey. You would not be the first. You will not be the second. You will not be the 1.25 million person because people do this all the time. 
Do you have any questions you want me to answer for you about this? Then you need to put them in the comments because we are almost done with our webinar for today. I want to show you really quickly how this works, how the syllabus works. If you go to projectmanagementmasterclass.com, if you want to be part of the masterclass done on Saturday, you actually could. This is how it's broken down. Week one, we hit Agile pretty strong. Goes into a little bit of week two, but week two, we're looking more predictive. Week three, more hybrid. And week four, we're looking to cement everything together. So we've done this a gazillion times for different companies over and over and over again. You got an experienced animal handler, okay? Just remember the likes of the FBI, the US Army, NASA, we train them all, many companies on the screen. You see them, right? The US Air Force flew me out to Mildenhall in the United Kingdom to train this stuff to our men and women in uniform. So you truly mean business. You need to go on down to projectmanagementmasterclass.com. This happens almost every month or every six weeks. You need to go on down to Project Management Masterclass to learn more, okay? That's the website, projectmanagementmasterclass.com. Like I said, we've got one starting off on Saturday. Now, I know some people, they have a concern and, and their concern is to do with the PMI. They're like, well, Phil, are there any hidden costs? <laughs> Let's talk about costs. Let's talk about money is PMI. They're not going to give you a free ticket to take the exam. They're going to be looking for some money, right? So let's talk about the money. Let's talk about the fees. So there are member fees to become a member of the PMI, but membership has its perks. The cost of membership is $139. If you want to take the exam as a member, it's only $405. If you are a non-member, then it's $555. So take a look at this table as at the time I put this together, right? This was a situation. Hopefully this uh, will not change for the worst, all right? But you're looking at $405 if you are a member, which costs 139. If you are not a member, it's gonna cost you more money. Now, I know some of you are already doing the calculation. 139 plus 405, Phil, that's 544. It is, so it's just a savings of 11, but a savings is a saving, right? If I were you, why not just become a member? This is what members also get. Members pay less for retake. So if you're a member, you're gonna, you're gonna pay less if for any reason you needed to retake the exam, which I sincerely hope not, but people have had technical issues and have had to do that because PMI said it's your fault and they were charged. So nah, don't want to go into the, all that. That's why I say take your exam in a test center, right? What about the, the certification renewal? Every three years, you need to renew your certification. So if you are a member, it's just 60 bucks. If you are not a member, it costs over two times that amount. So why not just go on down to PMI site? And by the way, I do not work for PMI. So, you know, I'm not trying to sell membership to you, but it makes sense. It makes sense, right? The PMP exam, you got three chances to pass the exam in one year. After the third failure, the candidate has one year wait. What good is that? It's no good. Don't do it. Don't. I would recommend that you take a look at the exam as something you want to do in the next three to four weeks. And don't think about failure. It's not an option in my mind, right? So why would you want to fail and wait a year? Why would you want to think of failing? Why would you want to gamble? Why not just get an experienced animal handler, right? That's what I would do if I were you. I wouldn't play Russian roulette with my money. Money is hard to come by for many people these days in the crazy pandemic, so you don't want to waste your money. You want to make sure it's a one-time thing. You take it one time and you're done, okay? If there are any questions, for those of you just come in, please put them in the chat. We're moving on to our final section here. This final section is to remind you about the exam breakdown. So the exam is broken down by people process business. This we've covered already. There's one more thing I want you to take a look at if you get a moment. Like all of this stuff we talked about for about 20 minutes, it's all whittled down into what I call the PMBOK guide mainline. 
this is a very summarized way of understanding the PMBOK guide. Think about it like a scaled version of the PMBOK. You can find this on YouTube. I've got a couple of videos out there that will walk you through. Just Google or just search for PMBOK mainline. You can type in praising and you'll find it, all right? But going into the exam content, the last piece that I really wanna hammer down on because like I showed you a few moments back, Agile is huge on the exam. Agile hybrid is at least 50%. Some people have said recently that they got some more uh, predictive stuff than Agile. So you, you still need to know both, okay? But if, if you're encountering Agile, it would be wrong for me not to inform you about Scrum. Hey, you gotta be bold with this stuff, my friends. I'm gonna show you one more study guide to get, and it's free. One free study guide. I wanna show you one free study guide. You may not understand why I'm giving you so much material, but when you get into the course or when you start studying it, you will appreciate it. I want you to go on down to this website. It's scrumguides.org. I highly recommend that anyone that wants to take this exam becomes a student of Scrum. Why? Because Scrum is the most popular Agile framework, the most popular. So I have, I've typed in for you scrumguides.org. The other website that I need you to go to, and this actually comes first, I want you to go on down to agilemanifesto.org. So let me put that in the chat as well. Go to agilemanifesto.org. Agilemanifesto.org, this is where we have the Agile Manifesto. Okay. The Agile Manifesto sets your mindset for why you should be agile and how, right? To be agile, you need to value humans, people more than processes and tools value getting a product working more than a bunch of documents. Documents are good, but you got to value working product more. You got to value collaborating with your customer rather than minutia and negotiating without having a collaborative mindset. You need to be collaborative and you need to look at responding to change over following a plan because what good is your plan when you need to change? And then if you scroll down, you get into some more of this great stuff in the principles behind the manifesto. And the highest priority that you should have is to satisfy your customer. You should also look to build projects around a motivated team. Get out of the way, let the team do their job. Stop standing in their way with red tape, trying to make them follow big old process that hasn't worked. Let the team figure out how to get the job done. All right. The other one here is keep it simple. This is my favorite. This is my mantra. Just keep it simple. Cut out the busy work. Do the bare minimum. Do the bare minimum that will get the same amount of value than doing all this other work. And last but not least, reflect on how you can become better. We call that a retrospective. All right. So going back to the first link I sent you, this is a study guide in my mind it's like a study guide it's called a scrum guide but i always recommend to my students to actually read this know it know what's in there it's going to help you all right so to to expand this on scrum let's talk about scrum very quick scrum is a lightweight framework that enables you solve complex problems without sweating it the way you would using other methods and other frameworks Right? The reason why we say Scrum is a framework is because you can change little bits and pieces within it. You can configure it, right? So it gives you an, a skeletal structure that you can put more meat on the bone if you want. The only thing the co-creators of Scrum, Ken and Jeff say don't do is take things out. You can configure it internally, but leave that framework. That's why we call it a framework. Scrum is based on three pillars, transparency, inspection, and adaptation. At a high level, you have three roles, five ceremonies, and three artifacts. There's a backlog of what the customer wants. 
you're going to plan each iteration. And iteration is a time box. It could be anywhere from one to four weeks in this world. But you're going to plan what to get done within those four weeks. And that gets put into a sprint backlog. So the moment you hit sprint planning, you're in the sprint. We also have two things. One is called a daily scrum. The scrum team meets daily to move things forward and to identify any obstacles. We also have an informal ceremony called backlog refinement. So instead of keeping your backlog growing wild, because remember, people can add to the backlog at any time. It doesn't mean it's going to be done, but it is the job of someone we call the product owner to keep that product backlog prioritized and straight. So your backlog could be very wild and all over the place without good estimates, without good ordering. We don't want that to happen. So we put some time aside in some projects, not all because it's not mandatory. On some projects, the product owner might be proactive you know, to do this. And when I say projects, I'm using that word kind of loosely because every sprint is a kind of mini project, right? A project starts and ends, but a lot of firms, they just use Scrum as a framework to keep delivering value, whether it's in a product or something else around the clock, right? Development and operations, DevOps, this is another mindset where Agile doesn't have to be so rigidly cadenced. And you find those folks using Kanban. So when you come into this world, you're going to find this flow-based Agile and this iteration-based Agile. This one right here is iteration-based Agile. However, some folks use it as a vehicle to keep on delivering streams of value. All right, so you get more familiar with the language when you come on board. There are three artifacts in the world of Scrum, product backlog, sprint backlog, and the potentially shippable increment. Like I said, there are three roles, the product owner who is responsible for value and prioritizing the backlog. The Scrum master is like the coach for the team. And when we say team at this other level, we're talking more about the developers. So you might hear in the Agile community, we could just loosely say team. Uh, but in this world of Scrum, we now say developers based on the most recent version of the Scrum Guide 2020 version. All right, so the sprint review ceremony is where our customers are going to review what we built, the potentially shippable increment. They're going to give us feedback. We're going to take that feedback and do some good things with it, either create additional user stories or decide what to do. The final thing we do is a sprint retrospective, and this it's very similar to looking at what went well and what didn't go so well and deciding what to improve on. You could improve right now. Maybe you're going to improve next sprint if you're not able to do it right now. Your mindset needs to be now's the time. Now's the time to get better. You know, this is one of the downsides of the world of traditional. We just take a look at what went well, what didn't go so well, and that's it. No one ever puts that into effect, you know, hardly ever because they're off on another project and forgotten, see? But um, that pretty much is it, my friends. At a, at a very high level, that is how Scrum works. All right, if you have any questions, anything you want me to address right now, I would be very happy to do so. Any questions, comments, concerns? If there's anything that threw you for a loop in what I said, now's a good time for you to ask because we are about to end the seminar. I think we've been going for almost two hours now. So I'm hoping this has answered all your questions. Don't forget, if you really mean business, you really want to get certified with an experienced set of individuals, you need to go on down to projectmanagementmasterclass.com. We've got one starting this weekend. This weekend on Saturday. You can be in that next class and like you've heard from many of our students on this channel, because they always come back to share how they did it. You'll hear them say, I didn't know I could do it in the beginning so quick, but I did. Yeah, you're going to get it done really quick. You are going to. So my recommendation to anyone who's very serious with this, go on down to the website, sign up. Let's get the show on the road. Let's keep it moving. Let's get you certified. Let's get you to dry land, okay? We're starting off this weekend with a, a healthy dose of Agile. That's what you're gonna get first. I gave you a little bit of it now. 
we're, we're diving into agile. And there's one misconception. A lot of people say agile is just for IT. That is not true. Agile is not just for IT. In fact, before we leave here today, let me call on my buddy Roy to just demystify how untrue that is. It is not just for IT. Agile concepts and practices have been used in so many industries, not just software, but hardware and hard products. So let's listen to what my buddy Roy has to say about this. All right, let's jump in and let's talk a lot about Agile. So first thing I want you to understand is that Agile is not just for IT. It came from software, obviously, absolutely. That's the history of Agile. That's where it came from. But if you even look beyond where the term Agile really got started, and actually a lot of these concepts come from manufacturing. So it's it's gone through many different iterations and um, Agile, Took a, took a, got a major hold of the software community because it, uh, the technology had caught up and it was easier to do things in iterations, stuff like that. But now we're using it pretty much everywhere. I, I do a lot of work. Marketing companies are doing it. Uh, if you're building physical products, like Phil and I have worked for organizations that build um, or work together on some organizations that have done built physical products like safety equipment, things like that. Um, I've done work for a company that uh, builds elevators and pharmaceutical companies, as I mentioned, construction, big in the research and development space. I, I I've heard some people say, well, you can't do Agile in R&D, you've got to do Waterfall. No, 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 actually we'd prefer the other because Agile is all about experimentation. It works great in R&D. I would suggest it's probably even better than Waterfall in that case. Again, not saying Waterfall is bad, simply that I would suggest that in that kind of a space, Agile is built for experimentation and learning. Now, some of the core concepts that you're that you're some concepts that I want you to understand as well is that there are practices, just like there are practices in predictive that are valuable for agile. There are also some practices in agile that are really good for your predictive approaches. So you can kind of blend some of these and get some value. I have lots of organizations that are doing waterfall projects and we teach them some what agile concepts that they bring into their agile projects and it improves them so you know let's let's make sure that we understand agile is not you don't have to be pure agile you don't have to be pure, pure waterfall you can kind of combine these things um one of the things that you that we really want you to take in internal and to internalize is the concept of process improvement it's continuous improvement uh, the actual term is kaizen k-a-i-z-e-n um, what this is, is a philosophy of always looking to get better, always trying to find a way of improving your process, improving yourself, improving your team and your relationships with your team members, improving your organization. So it's always looking to improve. So we could potentially take that and make use of that in our waterfall projects as well. Another concept that you want to get is the concept of eliminating waste. Often, not always, but often in traditional environments, you're really not focused on improving, you're focused on delivering. You're not focused on eliminating the waste that you have in your process. Again, you're primarily focused on meet that date. Well, if you think about it, if you're able to clean up your processes, eliminate waste, you know, there are things that are just not necessary, but we've been doing them forever just because we've been doing them forever. Um, if you look at those things and find ways of making things leaner, getting rid of the garbage that you don't need anymore, then you are going to be able to deliver more successfully. You're going to be able to meet those project deliveries. So it's not just about delivering, it's also making an investment in the process that enables you to deliver. And again, that's something that you can make use of regardless of what process you're following. It's more of a cultural behavioral thing than anything else. More culture, more behavior, my friends. And that is exactly what I'm trying to tell you. Agile is not just for IT. It's more about mindset, okay? Again, for those of you just come in, we're talking about PMP basics. For the past two hours, we've been covering a lot of content, but it's that time we need to shut it down. Just go on down to the website's projectmanagementmasterclass.com. You're looking to get this done once and for all. Again, you got to get an experienced animal handler because this exam crazy. It's crazy. It's a crazy exam. All right. One more time, I want to remind you, if you are a beginner, stuck beginner, you're like, Phil, I don't even know if I want to do this. You might want to get this book. It's called Project Management Layman's Guide. You can find it at the link below. You find this on Amazon. And if you truly want to get this done, become a member of the PMI first because you're going to be able to get PDF copies 
of a lot of the books that you're going to need for the journey, okay? If you have any specific questions, don't even hesitate to put them in the comments below. This video will be available after the fact once all the rendering is done and you'll be able to watch this over and over again, all right? Any questions before we round up? Any concerns? Did everything make sense? Okay, I hope everything made sense. We are going to go ahead and we're gonna end with a reminder of where you need to go. This is where you need to go. Here's a reminder. So you need to go on down to project management. Masterclass.com. Okay. If you're looking to take the exam and you are starting out fresh and you're like, I don't even know where to begin, do that. You've probably heard the expression, you know, people say time is money. And it's true, time is money because what you're going to save by doing this, you know, is a ton of time. So instead of going through some boring old death by PowerPoint course, just go down to projectmanagementmasterclass.com. For those of you that are very close to taking your exam, maybe you're like a few days out, maybe two weeks out, I would recommend going to a different site. It's hpmexam.com. We have a Four hour immersion boot camp. Four hour boot camp. This boot camp gets people to final ship shape because some of you have been to training that wasn't any good. You know, you just wanted the contact hours and you're like, you know, let me, let me just get the contact hour, but you're even confused and you're like, I need someone to help me. Yes, I've got my contact hours, but I'm not, comf I'm not comfortable you need to go on down to hpmexam.com. We have a brilliant deal going on right now for four boot camp starts on Sunday. Every Sunday, you can find this boot camp happening for the most part. It's live via Zoom. You know, we encourage you to come on, turn your camera on, interact with other students. We've got a group on LinkedIn that we've put together to begin to help folks accelerate their final efforts. It's called HPM for hybrid project management, because this is really a hybrid exam, right? So hpmexam.com, okay? I hope I answered all the questions and all the concerns that you have. If not, feel free to let me know what they are. Everything makes sense? Adewale, thank you very much for your chats and your engagement. Highly appreciated. Thank you, all those of you that are on the call. Don't forget to hit that like button because it helps us and the algorithm and it helps people find this great content that we put out, okay? Don't hesitate to let us know whatever you need more videos on. All right, my friends, you take care. I'm gonna leave you in the capable hands of my buddy. He's gonna talk to you one more time. I'm gonna jump off. And after that, we'll round up for today. But Roy is going to talk to us one more time. And this time, he's going to talk to us about the Agile Manifesto values. Values are so important. So Roy, let's jump into that. Listen to our buddy. Thank you once again. And I look forward to speaking to you soon. Let me leave you with Roy. Let's listen. So the, the Agile Manifesto was put together back in 2001, and it was, um, it was called the Snowbird Summit. It was a bunch of folks that got together out in, in Utah. Uh, pretty sure it was Utah. Uh, that's not an exam, so don't worry about that. Uh, but they, they got together, and um, they wanted to kind of consolidate the industry a bit. There were lots of Agile practices going on prior to 2001. Agile's been around for quite a long time, actually. But there were a lot of these practices going on, and they were really not coalescing. So they, they got together and they talked about how do we bring the, the, the community together? So they came up with a manifesto. The manifesto is really a set of values and principles that help us drive culture and behavior and philosophy 
rather than about practices. It's, this is not about the practice. You're not going to see anything in here that is really specific to Agile. You can make use of these values and principles in your organization today, even if you're not doing Agile, and you'll, you'll likely get better. It's about building good organizations and good behaviors. So there are four values and 12 principle, principles. It starts out by saying we're uncovering better ways of developing product by doing it and helping others do it. And through this work, we have come to value. And I want to be clear on these so that you don't go down the agile myth road. There's a lot of agile myths out there. And let's make sure that we really understand this. So you know what agile is and what agile isn't. 